Institute of Aerospace Engineering, SRM Institute of Science and Technology. I warmly invite and welcome the most important uh, participants and the speaker, Mr. Sendil Kumar Vaidishwaran Karu, uh, for this uh, technical webinar on the interesting topic, Introduction to Stress Analysis of Aircraft Cabin Interiors. So one thing I would like to tell here, uh, some few participants, they called me and asked, sir, we studied aircraft structures in undergraduate and postgraduate, but we couldn't hear, uh, heard uh, a topic kind of uh, cabin stress analysis and all. So what was it about like that, they asked. I told you, just join the session. Uh, the speaker, Mr. Sindil Kumar, uh, is the right person uh, to clear your uh, doubts or whatever it is. I hope uh, I told right, uh, Mr. Sindil Kumar. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for joining this uh, session on introduction to stress analysis of cabin interiors. And a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Silva Kumaran, sir, uh, for uh, spotting me and then asking me to give a topic on this very uh, uh, session. I'm so, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Sadil? Uh, Sadil, one minute. One minute, one minute, one minute. I let me finish. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Sendil Kumar, he did his master's degree in aerospace engineering at uh, Mos Moscow Aviation Institute, uh, Russia. So, he is having more than 15 years of experience in the aviation industry, and he is working with uh, Boeing Commercial Aviation Services Europe uh, Limited in the uh, United Kingdom, and he is designated as Senior Cabin Interior Specialist, Stress and Certification, and he is having a lot of experience. Already, I have shared professional certifications in the uh, annotation itself, webinar annotation, okay? So he's having, uh, I mean, he's capable of providing leadership to manage projects using project management methodologies, stress analysis of composite cabin interior structures and engine nozzles, witnessing structural tests of composite interior monuments, also minor and major design modifications, cabin safety, ESA part 221J, etc. Still, yeah, the resume keeps going on. So let me stop with this, there's no time. So, uh, Mr. Sadil Kumar, over to you. You can start the session. Yeah, thanks a lot, sir, uh, for yeah. giving me, uh, giving a bit of background about me. I'll, uh, I think it's, it's better that we start the session and and listen. I'm very interested in listening to all the participants and uh, what questions they're going to ask at the end of the session. Uh, hope you all find this very interesting. We are going to do this uh, particular course like stress analysis and certification in two parts. And today we are going to uh, have a session on the stress analysis of cabin interiors. But again, it's, it, it's, an, it's an introductory course. Uh, I'm not going to go very detailed and you know write so many equations and bog you down. Um, so on Friday, there'll be another session, which is part two on the uh, certification uh, or certification of cabin interior monuments. So we are going to cover uh, overview about aircraft interior industry and what and understand the types of interior monuments and the purposes in this uh, session. And we are going to talk a bit on general design and construction of aircraft interior monuments. And obviously our main topic of interest is stress and certification. We are going to talk a lot about stress and certification and analysis part of uh, aircraft interior monuments. Again, this particular session today is we are going to concentrate only on the stress part. And session on the Friday, we'll be talking more about getting certification and doing testing of cabin interior monuments. So in this slide, I have given who are all the major players in the aircraft interior industry. Before we jump into technical details and other stuff, uh, it's better that we, we uh, understand uh, who are all the major players uh, in the aircraft interior industry. Obviously, you'll see Boeing and Airbus there. And again, Collins, Jamco from Japan, Zodiac Aerospace, 
uh, aim altitude, then there are a few seating companies like Deal, Actor Seating, uh, Midas, uh, Midas Seating here in the UK. They do uh, cabin interior seating. On the top right hand side, I've just given given a bit of figures on what the industry looks like. But this particular data uh, is taken from 2013. You could see the aircraft interior industry has generated uh, $6,500 million uh, revenue in 2013. So if you see, if you, if you look at that particular pie chart, you could see Zodiac Aerospace uh, plays a major, major uh, role in producing the aircraft interior components uh, than, than, any other, than any other player in the business. Then again, Collins Aerospace has got wide uh, facilities here in the UK uh, in, and in Philippines. So again, as well as Janko, Janko is one of the companies or one of the forerunners in the business who has been in this, in this industry for a very long time. So this particular chart shows us that, you know, aircraft, how important aircraft interior industry is and how much revenue is being generated every single year. So I, I uh, practically wish that in future we'll be seeing some of the major players from India too. Okay, when we talk about cabin interiors or when we refer cabin interior structures, what are they really? They, if you step inside an aircraft and practically whatever structure that you see inside the aircraft or an airframe, everything is cabin interiors. So there are different type of structures um, in uh, different type of cabin interior structures. They are secondary supports, fairings, galleys, labs, and we have got bar units. Then again, it's right from the floor. It, as soon as you enter the aircraft, you walk on the floor. Even floor is a part, part is a major part or, or it's a major structure of a cabin interior component. And you, you, you have all the overhead storage panels and practically everything that goes inside the cabin or cabin interior structures. So in this presentation, we are going to talk about the design aspects of cabin interiors. And again, what process we follow for uh, certifying them. So this particular presentation will be an overview of all the process and procedures that we follow in the industry. So if you have got any questions or any particular question, it's not, not technical, but other than technical questions, I'll be happy to hear at the end of the session during, the, during our Q and A. So just to understand or just to visualize uh, how these cabin interior components look like, I've added few pictures in the next few slides that I'll be talking through. Here you can see, I've added pictures of typical galleys, passenger seats, business class seats. And again, there are divided panels then in the top left picture, you could see how these cabin interior monuments are located inside the aircraft. And this particular which every airframe manufacturer is producing is called interior configuration map. And they actually uh, produce these configuration maps before all the interior monuments and all the passenger seats get practically installed uh, in an aircraft. And uh, why it's called as a map? Because you would, by practically referring to that configuration map, uh, anyone will come to know where a particular galley or a particular business seat or a particular storage unit or a particular lab is located. It's just, it's just a um, big uh, pages and pages of diagrams 
uh, referring to where each and each and every units are located with respect to the airframe and they will give all the references uh, in it and what is installed and what is available in that unit, et cetera, and et cetera. In this slide, we could see a uh, few more aircraft interior components, including entertainment system that goes back at the, uh, uh, at the, at the back of the seat. Again, we have got different kind of passenger seating system, economy, business, and first class uh, uh, systems. And accordingly, the seat design and installation will vary. And again, uh, quite recently, Cathay Pacific and Virgin um, Atlantic, they have come up uh, with a concept of uh, introducing passenger modules where uh, first class and business class uh, or the executive class uh, people can actually uh, take rest or sleep during the course of the flight, that um, there have been quite some work being done in some of the aerospace uh, interior industry on that uh, with respect to the passenger modules. Again, on the far right, top right, you could see um, uh, a picture of passenger service units, PSU units, and overhead, overhead cabins where you would actually store your luggages and put your put your handbags and things like that. On the bottom left, you, use, you could see labs, labs or um, labs. There are, there are a few companies who concentrate mainly on the labs, labs design and, you know, producing the lab uh, for, typically for, for a passenger aircraft and for a, for a chartered flight or a business flight and things like that. On the bottom, Bottom right, you could you could see um, all the cabin interior structures that go inside the main cabin where pilot and co-pilot sits. In this slide, I've shown uh, pictures of bog alleys that are installed in the first class and business class uh, cabin units, and these bog alleys or um, they generate a lot of business uh, with respect to uh, cabin, uh, with, with, with respect to uh, uh, pre, uh, uh, premier airlines, because they, uh, are, they are a bit complex in building itself. And at the same time, they should also look attractive uh, when uh, installed in an aircraft. So there are a few different challenges involved in building up of bog alleys and then putting them together, uh, doing the stress analysis and getting the certification. Yes, moving on to the next slide. Before we get into the actual uh, details of stress analysis and how things are getting, how things are analyzed or how things are getting certified let us give a thought about what are all the general design that are followed in, in, in any industry or in an aircraft industry right from the scratch. Assume yourself as a product manufacturer or an aircraft interior product manufacturer. Then what, what are all the steps you potentially do right from the scratch? So to get your product certified and make sure that your product is safe and it goes inside the aircraft. So you would start by uh, putting together all the requirements in place and you will come up with a concept idea. Okay, this is how I'm going to build it. This is how I'm going to design it. Maybe you will brainstorm few ideas or you will hire a panel of experts and then you all sit together and talk okay, let's, let's all develop a cabin interior product that looks very attractive, that's very light, that's very safe in operation. And that meets all the airworthiness requirements. And you know, that's going to generate a lot of revenue if, if, if an airline likes it. So you, you come up with a set of ideas and then it's the very, the very next stage is planning and designing of those 
putting putting all those ideas in the paper and then you move on to the planning and designing phase and that's where it's uh, it's it becomes very critical because in the planning and design phase you set uh, yourself a lot of goals one goal is to minimize the weight reduce the cost of production and then you are you take up the task of selecting the material you know you you need uh, appropriate you need to use appropriate materials to bring down your cost and at the same time it should have structural strength and rugged stiffness so those are all the challenges that in front of you you take the challenges and then you come up with the design there are several companies um, uh, in the aircraft interior industry they uh, use stress analysis or structural substantiation or fe analysis of the cabin interior monuments at the end of the planning stage or when when they produce and when they come up with a conceptual design they want to use fea and then see whether the structure is good or not whereas some of whereas some of the industries as soon as they come up with the planning they actually produce a prototype using the materials and they come up with a finalized design okay when your design is finalized they tell okay let us go on let us go and do an fe analysis or structural analysis to see whether our structure has got record strength and stiffness to withstand all the loads um, when it is actually uh, when it will be actually installed in the aircraft so that's where our uh, stress and certification step is which is very very critical um, in the entire uh, engineering design process we need to understand it uh, from a broader sense why we are using this stress analysis why you are using this fe analysis in the industry obviously there are there are few challenges one thing is reducing the time you have to bring down the time right from the right from the start to till the time you deliver the things to the customer they are uh, obviously now airline business or very very critical and they look um up to the industry to save time and get the product out as soon as possible at the same time the you have to bring down your cost much you have to save money uh in practically using the material and again when i say about the cost and materials the main important thing that comes to the mind is the weight of the structure because the weight of the structure is plays a very important role Uh, you can't build up a structure with tons of weight and put inside the aircraft because that's going to load the airframe and you need to have a minimum weight your interior should should be uh, looking sleek at the same time it should have both strength and stiffness it should have a minimum weight and at the same time it should also meet all the safety requirements uh, prescribed by the agency so that's where this particular design process helps us to understand uh, how important this stress and fe analysis process is moving on to the next slide in this slide we'll just see how important our stress and certification process is and also what are all the procedures that we follow in the stress and in when i talk about stress process the main role is building up of one building an fe model because this finite element analysis or finite element method is used to compute interface loads and predict the load distribution in the structure when i said that all these interior monuments are installed in an aircraft in the inside the aircraft and these interior monuments are attached to the airframe at the top and as well as at the bottom so the our main aim is to uh, for using fem is to predict the loads that go into the airframe and again these uh, loads are in turn 
are again used to predict the margin of safety, or they're again used in uh, determining the load factors or uh, uh, or safety factors uh, uh, calculation. And and uh, at the same time, you are uh, the product that you are certifying or product that you are analyzing should meet all the compliance requirements prescribed by the agency. So there are a few critical criteria that should be definitely met. And one of them is your interior monument should not fail during any of the uh, critical load case or ultimate load case uh, in the, in when an aircraft is subjected to. Because the main thing that the agency says is the safety. Uh, when an interior component or a monument is installed in the aircraft, they should not cause any hazard to the occupants, uh, which are the passengers in an aircraft. So uh, whatever analysis methodology that you are using to uh, provide the stress analysis for the structure should be an acceptable method by the agency and should be of aerospace standard or that, that method which you are using should be a global method or should have been used by all the aerospace majors or should, or should have been, in other words, it should be an approved method. And the other thing is the structural uh, monuments or the structures that uh, that you are installing in the aircraft. Uh, I'm just going back to the uh, previous slides. If you see these structures or indeterminate structures, they're, they're somewhat complex. And for analysis problems in the uh, industry, you could use hand calculation, whereas for complex structures, you should use FP analysis or finite element method. So again, these particular uh, structures like cabin interior structures, which are different for different aircrafts. So the main key requirement from the customer or the agency or the safety agency is whatever stress analysis or whatever analysis that you do, it should be backed up by a static test. So you should practically carry out testing of this component before you could get certification from the agency. And again, there are several criteria for the test. If your structure is similar to the structure that has been previously certified, then you could show comparison to the previous structure and also show that your loads are lesser than the structure that is already certified and then apply for a new certification. Whereas if your structure is different in configuration and if your structure has got a greater loads or if, if the structure is you know complex, if it has got more attachments, then definitely the agency or, or the customer they request you to test the structure practically, and then they request you to produce all the test results and apply for the certification of the product. So moving on to the next slide, I've just had a few slides uh, for the people who are new to the method of finite element analysis. So, so what is FEA? So finite element analysis or method you could call is just a numerical method for solving problems uh, where we practically discretize the physical structure into number of finite elements where we mathematically model them and then analyze them. So why we need FEA, why can't we uh, simply use 
all the uh, hand calculation techniques which are recommended in strength of materials or theory of elasticity, um, you know, those calculations you could use for a simpler problems, like a take for an example, a beam problem. You can analyze the real beam or a truss structure as an as an windy structure, and then apply the mass at the CG, and then give you know you can you can calculate the bending moment reactions and things like that. Whereas practically, you have got a, a complex structure like airframe or engines or for, for in this case it's interiors. All those complex structures uh, you can't you can't analyze them or you can't uh, predict the exact behavior using the hand calculation. There will be so many unknowns, there will be so many parameters you have to consider. So when the structure is complicated, so um, what I mean here is geometric and both material, uh, sometimes you end up dealing with nonlinear materials. So that time you got to use FEA. And again, in, in, in our specific case, all the cabin interior monuments mostly are indeterminate structures. So you got to use uh, definitely finite element method in, in predicting the internal load distribution and stresses and, and, and see uh, whether the structure is safe or not. Again, I've just added another slide here uh, just to recollect some of the basics of FEA. This uh, finite element problems are called as uh, boundary value problems or field problems. Why we call field problems? Because in the previous slide, I've told that we are, uh, what we do in the FE is we model the physical structure and discretize the structure into number of finite number of elements. <clears throat> and if you consider one particular element, and for example, here I have quoted uh, shown a simple triangular element with three nodes uh, in the in the red box. If you see that particular element, what 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 are the things you could see at the boundary of the elements? At the boundary, there are nodes of of this particular element, and again, this element is connected to the next element at the nodes, and again that element is connected to the and another element. Likewise, all the elements are connected to each other uh, at the nodes. So when we analyze the structure, the main, or when we use the finite element method, <clears throat> the main unknowns or the field variables are the nodal displacements, forces, or stresses. And again, in, in most of the FE method, what we do is uh, we compute or uh, we compute we compute uh, this nodal forces, nodal displacements, uh, mainly at these nodes uh, uh, for the uh, finite element model. And if you want uh, to determine any of the unknowns in the domain or in the field region, they are done using interpolation equation. So. In this very example of a uh, three noded triangular element, assume we have got one unknown, which is displacement at each of the nodes, like at node one, it will be U1 or phi one, phi two and phi three. So we have got three unknowns, which are the displacements at these three nodal points. So if you want to find uh, how this particular unknown is going to vary over the domain region, then I have, uh, that can be determined using the uh, safe function uh, equation, or they have done through an interpolation technique. And again, I've listed the safe function equation on the left-hand side. If you see in the equation, the term phi one, phi two, and phi three, all the feed variables, those are the unknowns at the nodal points. So what, what we mainly do in the FEM is, since I told we 
exactly model the physical structure. We define the stiffness, which is the material property. And we have got a known value, which is the force that we are applying to the structure. Or um, sometimes you apply constraints, which is the boundary condition to the, to the uh, attachment points in case of aircraft interiors. This galley or lav, they are attached to the airframe at the top and at the bottom. So you constrain the nodes or you apply boundary conditions. So what finite element software does is it will start writing the stiffness matrix for each and every element. And then it will derive a global stiffness matrix for the entire structure. And what is the unknown that we have uh, here? The unknown can be displacements. So it will determine the unknown uh, from the stiffness matrix and it will give us the output. So this is, this is just the basic of FEA, I've just I've explained to you in simple terms uh, for people who are very, very new um, to this uh, methodology. There are few general uh, procedures. There are three general procedures uh, if you do an FE analysis. One is pre-processing, um, second is uh, solving the actual problem, and the third is the post-processing. In the pre-processing step, we uh, study the geometry or come up with the geometry of the domain. And in the second, uh, or in the same step, we also choose what kind of elements we are going to use to idealize our structure. So this is a very key step because the choice of element should be right because you are actually going to represent the physical behavior of the structure. And you have to give appropriate material properties or correct material properties for the structure to behave or to predict its actual behavior. And the solution step can be done using the finite element software that you are going to use. And it computes uh, all the unknown that, that, that you want, like stress, strain, displacements, and forces at, at whatever location you want to see. And post-processing step is one of the very interesting step, uh, uh, which, is available in which is available in all commercial FE softwares nowadays. Uh, where you can view your results and where you can print them and then uh, do all your or carry out all your analysis after that. And in this slide, I've just added info about Pattern and Nasten. Why Pattern and Nasten? Because we are commercially uh, using that worldwide in the aerospace industry. And there are several options that are available to us in pattern and Aston. You can carry up linear, non-linear, then again, frequency response, transient response, et cetera, and et cetera, and eigenvalue problems. And oh, the aerospace industry mainly use pattern and Aston because Aston is stands for NASA uh, stress analysis tool. And they have initially developed or coded Nastan, which is a solver uh, to meet or to take into consideration um, uh, all the aerospace uh, uh, scenarios like, uh, like how a 2D, like 2D plates behave, uh, all the Timotion co theory has been inbuilt into it when they have coded uh, Nastan um, analysis code. The pattern is used for pre-processing and then doing and post-processing. Whereas Nastron is, as I mentioned, it's a solver. You could solve uh, the problems or the finite element uh, uh, problems that you are building. So we have talked 
about the general design concept and we talked uh, we talked about bit on the fei so in this slide i have uh, put together an information about what what materials we are going to use uh, in 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 cabin interiors and how do we meet all the safety requirements the cabin interior structures or interestingly they are made made from composites and aluminum alloy components on the bottom left hand side i've just uh, put a picture showing how much amount of composites have been or being used in the production of the aircraft if you see more than 50% of 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 the materials that are used in an actual aircraft are composites and again we have got uh, a large chunk of aluminum and titanium materials are being used these the main the key requirement of cabin interior material is these materials should provide uh, safety comfort uh, for the passengers who are occupying the aircraft and at the same time they should meet uh, cs 25.853 requirement which is uh, toxicity and smoke requirement so what happens in 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 case of fire accidents or unfortunate events so when when the aircraft is in the fire so it should it should this cabin materials or the materials that that has been used in manufacturing of the cabin interior monuments they should not emit toxic gases they should so there are also flammability requirements where this material should be able to self extinguish themselves after 3 seconds or after 2 seconds uh or since the fire is uh, if the fire has started so those kind of stringent requirements are there the main reason for this requirement is it should give any passenger or any occupant in the aircraft uh, a reasonable time for them to escape uh, uh from the region of accident or any unfortunate event and again i have added a uh, few slides on composite materials for people who are new uh, or who are uh, hearing what composite materials or the term composite for the first time composite materials or or i will say it has an engineered materials they are made from two or three different constituents and they act they are they act together as one particular component so generally the composite material will have a laminar uh, which is uh, a yeah, um, uh, skin and and then you have got cores uh, which is in the um, uh, center portion in a honeycomb and again this skins and cores are bind together by a continuous matrix material um, which can be a resin material and the, in in the aircraft industry we use a uh, polymer matrix material as the key matrix which are made from epoxy resins on the left hand side of the presentation uh, i have shown what are all the common materials that we use for the interior uh structures on the right side you could see i've added few pictures showing uh, commercially available uh, composite materials whether it's a glass or carbon fiber uh, woven or uh, components basically all the panels or the main structural panels of an of an aircraft interior uh, structure they are made from carbon or fiber glass uh, panels or fiber glass lamina sheets and again we use a uh, standard honeycomb structure with uh, no mix aramid cores uh, and also there are regions that needed reinforcements or those are the regions which are close to the attachment re attachment area or at the floor panel we use uh, honeycomb structure that has got uh, aluminum core in it 
And for the bonding, we use epoxy or phenolic resins and mostly epoxy adhesives are used. And again, as, I, uh, as you have seen in the previous slide, uh, there are, uh, I, I mentioned to you that these bar galleys and other storage units and labs, they should be looking really attractive uh, to the occupants. So for finishing part of it, uh, we use deco panels, which are again, uh, you know, some kind of synthetic panels. In, in case of seats, uh, for example, the, the, the aircraft seating uses uh, synthetic leather or uh, natural wool fabric uh, materials. And in case of floor, we uh, use uh, floors with, there are different zones in the floor, uh, depending upon what, what, what monument is in or what load is going to act on the floor. So they use uh, 31 mil or 41 mil aluminum core panels. And again, on top of the floor, there are uh, uh, most of the cases, they use woolen carpets and again, uh, uh, polyvinyl chloride uh, base sheets and things like that, just for the attractive uh, purposes. So when we talked about the materials, there are few material characteristics that are very, very important and key to the aircraft interior industry. So one of the main thing that I've already mentioned is toxicity and, and other thing is flammability. And again, these materials, uh, they should have uh, low weight, low density, and they should be have adequate stiffness and adequate uh, strength. One of the key challenges of aircraft industry, uh, aircraft interior industry is getting these materials in place and then using them for manufacturing, which is the major cost to the industry. So with respect to the safety uh, point of view or certification specification point of view, there are a few general requirements that are very much uh, uh, that are enforced for an for an cabin interior structure or or a galley structure, uh, <coughs> which should be considered before we look into the detail of of a particular um, cabin interior structure. So, one particular requirement is all the structure that you are putting together or whatever components that go inside the structure should, should, should act as a single unit. The reason for that is if you are, you are say for example, a stowage monument or a lab that could have n number of small, comp small components, but in the actual flight, when, when a passenger occupies the lab, or when he actually uses, or when the crew member uses the storage cabinet or galley, none of the components should come loose and none of the components should cause any hazard uh, to them during the course of the flight or during takeoff landing, or when there is a crash scenario, you know, none of the components should get detached from the airframe and they should not cause any hazard to the occupants or passengers. And all these surfaces, they should look decorative and attractive. And again, one of the key thing is from the loads point of view, they have, uh, that the safety agency uh, recommends is, you should analyze your structure for all the worst case loads uh, that are possible to occur during the course of, during the different course of flight. Uh, whether it is landing, takeoff, or during the crash inertia case. So whenever you are analyzing and testing the monument, you practically got to test that in different orientation so that you know your monument or your structure is able to take different loads from, from, from different load cases and 
they should be able to we should be able to demonstrate safety or compliance to the requirements and one of the last and but key requirement is deflection or displacement your cabin structure or interior structure should have sufficient stiffness they should not undergo large deflection during the course of the flight or during crash inertia scenario because what happens when when there is a large deflection uh, there is a chance that your cabin interior monument or a structure could interfere with the neighboring structure and other thing is when there is a large deflection it becomes a large geometric nonlinearity problem or geometric nonlinear problem so there will be a change in the load path and things like that which which leads to further complications so choice of materials choosing the right materials and bringing down the cost then the materials that should show adequate strength and stiffness or the key uh, requirements um, that we should consider when we uh, put together our design and do the analysis okay let's get let's look into specific detail and understand uh, how a typical cabin interior uh, structure or a monument looks like in this case i've taken a galley for example the galley uh, again i uh, there will be there are people who are very new um, uh, to this terminology galley is nothing but a storage unit or a storage unit uh, which can hold uh, different things which are operated by the crew members uh, there are bun warmers fridge uh, imagine it's like a wardrobe it can hold it can it has several compartments it can hold uh, uh, several things um, storing of food 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 materials then there are bar galleys which can store wine bottles and other things they will have inbuilt uh, refrigerators uh, 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 which are uh, attached as an external unit to the structure so i'm just quickly going quickly uh, go to the next slide and show what galleys are uh, so in this slide uh, this picture is taken from a multitude website you can see uh, what what galleys are so at the bottom on the 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 blue color ones are the trolley carts or the meal carts uh, where your meal is stored basically uh, when you fly in the aircraft on the top you could see uh, three mode uh, refrigerators on the uh, right the big ones on on the very top there are uh, compartments for store for storing uh, miscellaneous items so this particular yeah, galley structure or a typical galley structure what what do they have they have got structural panels which can take the payloads which are coming to the uh, structure and at the top they have got upper attachments metallic upper attachments which are made from aluminum alloy and at the bottom they are attached to the floor uh, using the lower fittings and again uh, from industry to industry there are different terminologies used like we call bridge fittings lower fittings uh, or, or in 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 case of one industry and and it might be a bit different on the other industry or simply they might call it just as a lower attachment i've in this slide i've just put together what materials we are going to use uh, in in uh, manufacturing all this composite structure so the main structural panels or composite honeycomb panels they they are made they use domexco and as well as the main compartment panels and the door panels and again there are different type of course available like if you if if there are key structural panels which are attached to the lower attachment and the upper attachment they use sometimes aluminum core and um, in most cases they use domex core uh, e, uh, and for the compartment doors sometimes we use the foam core which is a lighter 
a lighter uh, core or it has got a lighter density. And again, we have got um, uh, aluminum, uh, uh, aluminum components, which are the upper attachments and the lower attachments. And again, these galleys are made as modules. You know, they, uh, they are constructed in a modular form. And uh, if, if you ask me, this, this particular galley, which I've shown in this slide on the left, is made into two parts. One is the upper part of the galley, and other is the lower part of the galley. And these two parts are attached to each other uh, using the, um, uh, we use it structural joints. They are called as split line joints. So in this very presentation, you know, we are going to talk about uh, just overall and it's just an introductory presentation. I'm not going to get into specific details and mention, okay, this is how we are going to connect and things like that. Because it could take a day long or more if I get into specific details. Similarly, there are few other components in the galley uh, that are considered as safety components, like turn buttons, which are shown in the red on the left-hand picture. Uh, you could see there are red color um, uh, components or the metallic components that hold the trolley cards. They're called as turn buttons. And again, there are metallic extrusions attached to each of the panel. They're all made from aluminum alloy, either 2024 or 6082 or six series aluminum alloy. And again, the key um, components, which are upper attachments and lower attachments, they are made from um, aerospace grade, which is 7075 material aluminum alloy. Okay. So we talked about the um, what materials we are going to use to meet our strength and stiffness criteria. And we talked generally about if what's, what's, what is finite element method. Uh, now getting, getting into the details of the FE model for the galley. So generally speaking, uh, we use different, met, different elements in FE, uh, like 1D and 2D elements, 1D bar and beam and 2D or tria and quad uh, elements. And uh, we don't use much of the 3D elements in, in the, uh, while in, in building up of the finite element model for the aircraft interior structure. This, if you want to do a detailed model for any of the component, then you could actually use the 3D um, elements. Generally speaking, uh, we are mostly the structural panels, the compartments and the doors, uh, all are model using uh, 2D, uh, uh, 2D uh, four noded uh, quad element or tri element. And we idealize uh, the upper attachments and lower attachments as uh, RB2 element, which is a rigid body element. And then we also model the C bush element uh, for representing appropriate stiffness at the airframe attachments. So I'm going to talk about few key things, but not going into very much detail about each and everything. As I mentioned in one of the previous slides before, these galleys are manufactured in a modular way, like top half separately and bottom half separately. And they are put together uh, and they are joined uh, each other using Mosul blocks or uh, split line joints. So just to give you an example of how we idealize this particular joint, uh, I have shown it on the left-hand side, we model the aluminum block, which is in the same region in the uh, FE. Hello. 
go ahead go ahead yeah we uh, model the metallic aluminum block uh, in the pcom layer and again um, there are i understand there are people uh, who are very new to nastron pcom is the composite uh, material definition card where you can define the number of plies or laminas and core uh, and and again you can give the material properties uh, and or strength properties um, to the composites so in the we have to model so what what we have done here to represent the joint is we have modeled uh, the aluminum block in the center element which is which is shaded in gray and then we have uh, model the two bolts at the split and joints using Seebusch elements. Uh, and again, we have calculated the stiffness using Fritz relationship. So I'm not going to get into very detail. And again, all the structural panels, they are joined with each other or one panel is attached to another using simpler concept called as modis and tenon or tab and slot joint. This uh, tab and slot joints or traditional form of joints that has been, that's, that's been in practice in the uh, carpentry industry for a very long time. So we use the same method or same uh, philosophy for attaching panel to panel or getting the panel to panel connection. But again, those, those attachments or uh, at the tap and slope joint, they are uh, uh, attached using the adhesive tool. And layer of adhesive is supplied at the top and bottom lamina when, when the joint is put together. So we idealize that as rigid body element, which is RB2 element. And again, there are people who are new to this um, uh, particular nastron and pattern uh, uh, field. So RB2 or rigid body element is nothing but an element that has got an infinite stiffness because our interest is not in the joint, but our interest is to see how we are transferring load from one panel to another. And as I said, we idealize this particular structure or this, these kind of joints using RB2 and we are still, we can still pull out the loads or forces at the joint and then analyze them separately uh, or individually, or we can do a detailed analysis and see whether the joint is good or not. And one of the other reason we are modeling this way is all these joints, the, as I mentioned to you in one of the previous slides, that it's the safety agency or uh, requirement that all the key structure or the, all the joints should be certified with test. So we need to perform actually uh, test and produce a, a full set of results or a results document uh, to, to, to get our um, methodology and everything certified. So that's, that's another reason that we don't, we don't have to spend so much of time in modeling the joint because how would it be certified by test? So what, what we need to concentrate in the FENS here is getting the loads uh, out of the monument or the attachment region. And in the few, um, in one of the slide earlier, I've shown uh, the uh, upper attachment and lower attachment of the galley. These are the key structural things uh, with which the galley is attached to the airframe. So suppose if, if anyone of you is asking, what are all the loads that a galley is subjected to? So to answer that question, I'll just simply tell that you have got an airframe and you are installing a galley or a monument. You are putting that uh, galley or monument inside the aircraft. So you are adding a load to the airframe. So upper attachments are used uh, by the galleys and attachment or, or storage compartments or any other compartment uh, to attach the galley on the top portion to the airframe. Whereas the lower attachment 
is uh, will attach this particular structure or the monument uh, to the flow. So our, as I mentioned before in a couple of slides, our main aim is to determine the interface loads or the loads of the interface of upper and lower attachments. The reason being that is we are interested to see how much of load is being transferred to the airframe. So that, that will help us to determine the safety margin that the airframe is going to have or, or, uh, or at the galley attachment. So again, we are modeling the uh, upper attachment, the tripod using the RB2 element. And at the same time, we are uh, modeling the tie rod, uh, which is at the very top, attaching the entire galley to the airframe uh, using the rod element or 1D element structure. And our boundary condition, one of the uh, important thing for the finite element is defining the boundary condition. So in case of any monument uh, uh, or any structure, here, as I mentioned a couple of times, that the main attachments are at the top and at the bottom. So obviously our boundary condition will be there at the uh, top upper attachment and at the lower attachment uh, will we'll again define set of boundary conditions which are attaching to the flow. In this slide, I've just shown how we idealize your typical lower attachment. But again, we are using RB2 or rigid body elements, and then Seabush element to represent the appropriate flow stiffnesses. These flow stiffnesses are uh, key values which should be modeled correctly in the FE model, because as I mentioned to you before, floor is a complex uh, structure. Floor can have different number of panels, and these panels will have a varying stiffness throughout the length of the aircraft because uh, there are different components installed at different stage. So you'll have business class seats, you'll have economic class seats, which are uh, a bit crowded. And at the same time, you have uh, different galleys uh, uh, coming at different locations. So the floor, uh, they have, they have if, you, if, you, if you actually look at the floor drawing or the floor structure, it's, it's a very complicated structure that has got, uh, stiffness running in both longitudinal and horizontal dry direction. And it has got number of panels that are attached to using splice joints uh, to, to meet the racket, uh, uh, to provide the racket stiffness. And these stiffnesses that are defined in the analysis of galley models, they are obtained either from the R-frame or the R-frame manufacturer for, for, for uh, representing the exact flow stiffnesses. So I've just added a slide uh, to provide more clarity uh, to you uh, how we are classifying uh, the aircraft into different zones and how this particular thing can influence the stiffness that a galley or any seat unit that is attaching to. So here we are, uh, you could see in the picture on the top uh, picture, we have shown, uh, uh, we have the, there have been a classification for the air cap zones that usually they are classified into four zones. Uh, zone four is at the uh, beginning of the aircraft and zone three at the back and zone one are the lateral zones and zone two is the zone in the center uh, for all the monuments that come in the zone two, you got to model the floor itself. The, not only the flow stiffness, uh, not only you model uh, just the she bush with the flow stiffness, you got to model the exact floor itself. The reason for being that is uh, the central region of the aircraft or the aircraft floor is very flexible. So you need to model the exact floor to predict the actual way your galley or your structure is going to behave in the analysis.
So we talked about idealizing the FE model. We talked about our assumptions or mandatory requirements that we should have. We talked about stiffnesses and what are all the, now we are going to talk about what loads, what are all the loads that typically cabin interior monument is subjected to. If you look from a broader perspective, for the airframe structure, you have got external loads like aerodynamic loads, and again, vibration loads from engine or that the engine is transferring to the airframe. Those are airframe loads. But as I uh, mentioned to you before, these are the structure which are, in, which are installed inside the airframe. So when they are subjected to an emergency landing case or a crash case, they are subjected to different load factors, which are G factors. And again, those uh, flight loads, uh, which are coming to the structure, they are a part of it. It's transferred to the monument, but again, uh, 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 in the aircraft or aircraft interior industry, uh, the loads grew, they put together a set of load factors that we need to use uh, uh, when analyzing the cabin interior structures. The other loads that I could think of is the abuse or assist load. Because as I mentioned to you before, these cabin monuments and storage units are all used by the cabin crew. So they open the doors, compartment doors, they close the doors, they take the trolley out, they put in the trolley in. And these are the loads that any um, human or any manually you could exert to the structure, obvious loads are the loads or the external loads that you could, um, you could uh, uh, put the, or you could subject the structure to while you're operating with it. And again, pressure loads. Uh, we all know that aircraft interior cabin is pressurized because as you travel to different heights, the, uh, with respect to the altitude, the pressure drops. So the cabin is pressurized to maintain the uniform pressure. So what happens when there is a cabin pressurization system fails? There'll be a sudden release of pressure throughout the cabin. So all, uh, all your monuments will be subjected to the sudden release of pressure. At that point, your cabin monument or a structure shouldn't become loose and shouldn't fly or shouldn't cause any hazard or shouldn't cause any danger to the um, occupants or the uh, passengers in the aircraft. Talking about the, again, about the design load requirements from the, uh, uh, with respect to the certification specification or with respect to the rules and regulation derived from the agency, CS 25.561 gives you a detailed uh, list of factors or the load factors that we should consider for analysis of interior structures and interior monuments. These factors are derived based on the experiences that, that from, from different aircraft industry that the safety um, or the agency has put together. And again, we have got in-flight and ground loading condition or ground condition during what happens, what are all the factors during in-flight scenario and then takeoff and landing scenarios. And again, these load factors, again, as like stiffnesses, they, they vary between uh, zone one and zone four or zone one to zone four. Uh, these uh, factors are again, practically determined by the loads group from all those tests and all their analysis they have done. So they put together all the load factors uh, in compliance with the rules of agency um, CS 25.561 rules and regulation. So whenever you are analyzing the cabin interior structure or testing, you have to consider all the worst case load factor. Uh, you have to take into account uh, uh, for, for your analysis and you have to check whether the cabin interior structure is safe and doesn't get detached 
during the course of flight, whether it may be due to whether it may be landing or takeoff or, or any other crash case, you know, you, you, should, you should show compliance to the rules and regulations of put together by the agency, which are certification specification rules and regulations. The last key thing in uh, modeling the uh, uh, galley structure is taking into account all the compartment loads uh, that is coming or acting on the galley. If you look into, if you look in the galley, there are different compartments. As I uh, mentioned to you in the previous, in one of the previous slide, we have miscellaneous compartment and we have got some big compartments that accommodate microwave, fridge, uh, bun warmer, and these kind of things. So you need to take into consideration all the masses that all all the payloads that come inside a particular monument or galley or storage structure, and then you should analyze it for the worst case load factors, which we have discussed in the previous slide. So the total force that you could expect to see in one particular direction will be mass of the galley into the appropriate load factor into 9.81 uh, meter per second squared, which is acceleration due to gravity. And again, if you ask me, how do we idealize the compartment masses in the finite element um, method or using FEA analysis? Uh, we normally uh, apply the mass at the CG using mass elements, but again, those masses are attached to the appropriate attachment points uh, where the units are getting attached to the panel or at the insert location of the unit, uh, we attach, uh, we model RB2 or rigid body element uh, at that locations. And then we attach, we, we model the mass element at the CG of the compartment. So we talked about compartment loads, stiffnesses, load factors, and how we idealize the key structural elements uh, in the galley. So by uh, then we use our, we take the help of our uh, commercially available pattern national software, then we solve it. And what are all the results we look, look at? We look at the uh, displacements, and then the interface loads are the top and upper and lower attachments for most of the structure. And for analyzing or to carry out detailed analysis of upper and lower attachment, we extract loads uh, from the loads model or from the finite element model. And then we carry out detailed analysis on the upper and lower attachment. And in the detailed analysis, we cover Lug, lug analysis, and then we do uh, section analysis just to see whether they have got enough reserve factors uh, to withstand the load or not. And in the overall uh, uh, model, we look at the galley displacement. As I mentioned to you before, we uh, look at the deflection, the way uh, the model behaves. The reason being is uh, the model should have appropriate stiffness uh, characteristics uh, so that it doesn't deflect too much and interfere with the neighboring structure or cause any load to the uh, neighboring structure. If there are any contact with the neighboring structure, then you have to analyze, you have to perform a separate contact analysis. You have to estimate the amount of load that is being transferred from one structure to other. Then you have to look into you know, you have to detailly do an analysis to come up uh, uh, with all the results. So I've just added uh, this particular slide as what, what, what are the general expectation that a customer um, um, requires in the aircraft when you're doing an analysis or the FE analysis of an aircraft interior uh, monument or structure. 
at the end of your analysis, you're required to produce a complete analysis report. That particular report uh, should cover everything. Like you should, you should be able to demonstrate your um, structure is safe and airworthy. You should show all the deflection. Uh, you should show the uh, interface loads and you should, you should show stress ports for all the key components like panels, then again, joints. As I mentioned to you before, we have analyzed it as rigid body elements. So what we do is we pull out the loads uh, from the finite element, and then we do a detailed hand calculation or we do a detailed analysis. Again, for the floor fittings, floor, all your report should cover all key items uh, in the monuments and at the attachment. I hope I have covered uh, 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 sufficiently what we uh, do in the stress analysis of cabin interior monuments. Thank you. Please let me know if, if we have uh, any question to ask. Hello, sir. Yeah, thank you. Excellent uh, informative session. Uh, Thanks a lot. Came to know a lot of things. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, can you discuss on the difficulties in stress analysis of composites, considering the design aspects and aesthetics, since FRP composites are used extensively in aircrafts? Yeah, that's a good question because over the years this aircraft industry or interior industry um, has become mature enough and you know we have practically at the start they started using a uh, few materials as I uh, said or as I um, said in the um, uh, initial presentation that certification is done by test so if you look at Composites, the behavior of the composites or uh, determining the uh, properties, it's all done by testing. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex thing because to go through agency and get the product certified, uh, you need to, they need to practically see how these materials behave in the test. And again, with, if you ask me, how that is done, it's again done through composite coupon testing. And again, we also have done test as an approver or a test witness. I witnessed the test uh, in which we have mounted strain gauges on the composite or on the uh, composite um, structures. And then we record how much strains uh, or deflections uh, in turn, you know, you uh, they produce and, and he, to carry out the allowables, we carry out coupon testing and then determine the allowables. It's a big process. And uh, uh, with respect to aesthetics, you know, again, as I mentioned, we use deco material or the finishing material, which are considered as non-structural and we don't model them in the structural analysis. And what we uh, model is just the key structural elements uh, of a structure. Yeah, we don't we don't model any decorative uh, element, but with respect to the safety agency or from the compliance point of view, if you ask me, these uh, decorative materials, as I mentioned to you, like CS twenty five dot eight five three spec mentions, uh, there are few requirements even for the decorative material that we are using. They should not emit toxic gas and they should be able to self-extinguish um, after a few seconds um, when the aircraft is on fire and things like that. So, but they're, they're just decorative materials and they're not structural materials. They're not taken into account in the finite element analysis. Hope I have answered the question. One more question, one more question. Yep. Any suggestions on online certification courses for structural analysis applications? Sorry, structural analysis of? Applications. Structural, applications? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by applications here? Is that applications? 
publication and, of aircraft interior industry or uh, yeah, whatever it is uh, you just keep in mind general like that uh okay you mean uh, they're interested only in i mean industry. yeah they i mean people are interested to know what are all the online online courses i yes. don't think uh, there there will be much online thing available for the aircraft interior analysis because this particular industry um, i would i would say is it's still maturing and then there are that is is mostly um, carried out uh, the work is mostly done outside the outside india and and uh, one of the key thing here is uh, after your bachelor's or masters when you enter into an industry uh, they the training that they give in the industry um, is is so much Thank valuable you. and it will help you to understand uh, more about the interior structures and it will help you to perform the packet job sindil yeah uh, could you see any questions uh, uh i'm in the group box. chat actually yeah. uh, pick up uh, appropriate question and answer we will end up within 5 or 10 minutes yeah i'm i'm in the chat window actually yeah uh, check questions uh, pick up uh, most important question then you can answer. yeah they are asking which software is uh, mostly used in aerospace engineering mm -hmm. the range of softwares are used but when it comes to the interior industry mostly uh, pattern and nastron is used and again for pre processing we are using hypermesh there are few industries which use hypermesh and pmac but mostly for solving and analysis nastron is used uh that's one question this is scroll up scroll up and check yeah and uh, they're asking can you give material list which are used in the aircraft so oh, there are there are a lot of materials that are used in the that's available in the google right yeah that's <laughs> that's <laughs> most of the things are available in the google but again i'll i'll request you to refer to grun or uh, michael new book that they could they list extensive list of materials which are used for different components and airframe structures then there is a scope for mechanical engineers in aircraft interior design yes there are scope for everyone um, whether you are from mechanical background or we are from from aerospace background uh, when you enter into an industry with your bachelor's degree or master's degree um, what they are going to ask in the interview is the basic strength of materials and theory of elasticity they are not going to go into detail and say that hey you can you tell me how you are going to analyze a galley structure no nobody is going to question you like that um, they are going to ask um, basic beams bending of beams and 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 basic plate theory and other things so even though you are from a mechanical background um i feel that you can you, you can very much work in the aerospace industry like most of the people uh, here in the uk yeah could you see any other questions yeah um there is one question uh, except composites Mm. so what will be the second best material you will prefer which can be used as cabin interior mm. um, well i am not uh, you know it's not my preference here because the the, <laughs> the thing is here the key players are the weight stiffness and the cost so you, you need to look into all the three uh, uh, specifically and again there are key material behaviors like if you uh, 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 for that i'm i'm just going to go back to the presentation um, to slide number 14 if if you could see here on the slide 14 i have listed in what way composites are much better than the other materials i hope you are you are able to see here um, in terms of weight thermal expansion stiffness and strength so composites are very leading material there are and again there are different materials used for different different structural elements if you look at uh, the top 
uh, upper attachments or lower attachments. Uh, they're all aluminum uh, casting. And again, if you look at the uh, uh, extrusions, they are aluminum sheet metal uh, components that are used in the uh, aircraft interior industry. If you need any reinforcements uh, at, the, at the location where the load is being transferred, yes, I agree, we use aluminum metallic blocks and aluminum doublers uh, for, for reinforcing the composite structure. But mainly to save weight, all the main structural panels are used in composites because here, not, not, you should not put the personal preference in, in front, but again, you should think uh, from, from the uh, advantages that each and every material is offering. And again, you should think what the safety agency is recommending us. And yeah, that's that's one more question. Uh, yeah. What is the material used for aircraft fuselage, and what are the requirements of stress analysis of aircraft fuselage? When you talk about the aircraft fuselage, is is just a large complex structure, airframe structure. If you, uh, I would point you to refer to Brune that talks about a lot of things on the fuselage analysis. Out of my mind, if, if you ask me what materials are used for the aircraft fuselage, again, they are using uh, composite and aluminum skins. Uh, uh, for the air frame components, which are mainly truss design, they use uh, aluminum uh, components. And if you, if, you, if you ask me what are the requirements of stress analysis of the fuselage, I think everything you need to consider right from the aerodynamic load and all the loads that all these interior monuments are going to transfer to the airframe and uh, all the vibration, mainly the vibration loads that are transferred from the engine to the airframe structure. That's analyzing the fuselage is a very complex one. So again, um, this fuselage, uh, we need to remember the fuselage is put together uh, in different uh, bulkhead to bulkhead or different uh, parts uh, running from a bulkhead to bulkhead. And again, uh, uh, these bulkheads are very complex in construction and analysis because they need to withstand, uh, they are called as pressure bulkheads as well when, when they have got, uh, uh, when they have to, when we have to take into consideration the cabin pressure uh, requirements and then analyze them for the cabin pressure also. So it's 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 a very complex structure to to analyze. And if you if you look at the way it is done, there are so many different groups and different people get involved uh, uh, over a length of time to do and analyze the complete fuselage. Thank you, Sandil, Mr. Sandil Kumar. And yeah, and that's very nice session. Excellent. No? Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, another yeah. interesting question. Yeah. That it's about testing methods which are used in the aircraft design. There are different testing methods, different rigs. If you ask about the interiors, we use a concept called as Wiffle. Uh, I'll be talking about the aircraft testing in the next session on Friday. Uh, if you took talk, if you are asking me about the general aircraft thing, then there are different different methods, you know, they mount that entire aircraft and do the uh, vibration test or uh, again for the strength test, they do it part wise or open testing for the uh, composite uh, panels and honeycomb structures. Excellent. Mr. Sandil Kumar. Yeah, thanks Excellent informative session. Uh, some uh, few professors from our department are there in the meeting. I would yeah. like to invite them to have a word about the session. Uh, yes. Sir, uh, Professor Ledger, sir, can you just, Professor Ledger, sir? Uh, one second, sir, I will, uh, I will unmute you, sir. Uh, now, it, now it, just, uh, just a word in the presentation. Uh, yes, sir, uh, sir, uh, good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, sir, sir, please. Uh, sir, sir, it was an excellent presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir, for your uh, valuable uh, uh, insight into this uh, APA. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks. So uh, I, I hope uh, that there are a lot of students have also joined uh, the presentation, if I'm right. Yes, sir. Yes. So I, I think uh, we, this is uh, going to be a regular uh, presentation for our students. Uh,
in a semester uh, or in uh, every three months like that. It will be very helpful for them. Uh, it will be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thanks for your all your time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, though I am more towards Louis, but still I got some. Uh, <laughs> uh, just to learn, I uh, just uh, joined the presentation. I learned a lot, uh, especially on the material side and uh, more than industry. What we have is more than academic side. Uh, it, it's really helpful. It's a really enlightening uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Ah, good evening, sir. Good evening, Sandeep Kumar sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, it is an immense pleasure to participate in this webinar session. By the way, uh, yes. the session was so excellent, and uh, a lot of information was there exclusively about the design aspects and the stress analysis. Especially, I was impressed with the composite uh, uh, materials. I'm looking forward for uh, similar sessions on this uh, kind of uh, webinars. Sir. Yes, thanks a lot, sir. Yes, uh -huh. I, I'm certainly happy to do uh, another presentation uh, on the composites. Maybe I can discuss with Silva Kumar and sir in the future. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Time uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Sandil Kumar, on behalf of our institution and our department. Thanks we'll a lot. We'll see sir. or meet again on uh, fifth, same time. Yeah, I'll circulate the invitation to all the participants for the certification yes. course. Yes, Thank sir. you very much. Live stream, a lot, is, live stream is going on in YouTube. Okay, you yeah, can have a look sir. if you want. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very sir. much. Sir, Thanks Thank a lot. Have a nice day. Bye. Yes. Take care. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Sir. Sir. Thanks. 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 Thanks.